While the country was distracted by lies about Christmas party this week, the Nationality and Borders Bill was passed in the Commons. The bill allows Priti Patel to radically change the way that the UK deals with asylum claims, as well as with British citizens who may be entitled to dual nationality. Here's a social media clip Priti Patel's team released boasting about the move earlier this year. We want to slam the door on foreign criminals, put organised crime gangs out of business, and of course, give the help and the support to those in genuine need. Fundamentally, Madam Deputy Speaker, this new system will be a system that is fair to those that need our help and support. And everyone that plays by the rules will encounter a new system that is fair but firm. So she says, everyone who plays by the rules will be okay in a system that is firm but fair. Well, both are very much up for question. One of the most outrageous clauses in the Nationality and Borders Bill allows Britons with dual citizenship or Britons who were eligible for dual citizenship and were born abroad to have their British citizenship stripped at the behest of the Home Secretary without any notice. This particular clause has caused widespread outrage. There was a New Statesman piece showing it would make six million people eligible to lose their citizenship without notice if Priti Patel so wished. You, you might have seen this, this sort of really went viral on, on Twitter over the last few days. According to the Office for National Statistics, this means about half of all British Asians and two-fifths of all Black Britons now suddenly find their British citizenship more vulnerable than it was before. The Home Office responded to the New Statesman piece by saying, Removing British citizenship has been possible for over a century and is always a last resort against the most dangerous people to protect our national security and public safety. It is rare, cannot leave anyone stateless and always comes with a right to appeal. This change is simply about the process of notification and recognises that in exceptional circumstances, such as when someone is in a war zone or informing them would reveal sensitive intelligence sources, it may not be possible to do this. The obvious riposte to that statement is that firstly, it's pretty hard to appeal a decision of which you have not been notified. And secondly, it requires us to put our trust in the Home Office to decide which situations are and are not exceptional. In the debate over the new law, Richard Bergen put that latter point well. I want to address the government's clause nine, which proposes removing people's citizenship without notice and in effect, removing their rights of appeal. When people from black and minority ethnic backgrounds raise concerns about this, deep concerns, the response from the government opposite is trust us. Yeah. Trust us, the people who deported black citizens in Windrush. Yeah. Trust us, the people who sent go home vans yeah. round working class estates. Trust us, the people who authored the hostile environment. Trust us, the people who are talking in this legislation about offshore detention centres. Trust us, the people who've created an atmosphere where people are trying to demonise people going into the waters uh, off our country, trying to save lives and prevent death. Trust us, it's no wonder that people at the sharp end of this government's hostile environment and the sharp end of this racist legislation, don't trust this government. So does the Nationality and Borders Bill represent a step change in how black and ethnic minority people are treated by the law in Britain? I spoke earlier today to asylum and immigration lawyer Alistair McKenzie. The changes the government is bringing in, or proposing to bring in, uh, would enable the Home Secretary to strip people of their citizenship uh, without informing them. So up to now, the government has been under an obligation to inform people before they take away their citizenship. They've been attempting to do it in secret. Uh, the High Court has recently told them in a case called D4, which involved uh, a woman alleged to have gone to join the Islamic State, that their practice of simply putting the decision on the file, on the Home Office file, and not telling them about the uh, decision being made was not, was against the law, was not lawful. So they can't simply deprive somebody of their citizenship uh, without telling them, according to the law as it is at the moment. So what Brady Patel is trying to do is change the law so that she can do that, essentially, so that she can take away somebody's citizenship without telling them 
in circumstances where, for example, she can't find them or it's not practical to tell them, but also in much broader circumstances, such as where she thinks it would be contrary to our diplomatic interests or simply generally in the public interest not to tell that person that their citizenship has been taken away. So this is a law which dates back some time, the power to take away somebody's citizenship on the grounds of that it's conducive to the public good, i.e. that it's in the public interest. The current form of the law basically dates back to the new Labour era, but it's been used much more frequently in recent years by uh, Tory governments. And what the government now wants to do is change it so that they don't have to inform people in practice before they can take away their citizenship. The argument the government put forward, and they say these these headlines about six million people now being more vulnerable are, are misleading because they say this is only applied in incredibly exceptional circumstances. You know, someone who's joined Islamic State or someone who's part of a grooming ring. I mean, what would you respond to that? This idea that this will only ever be applied in extreme circumstances, so you don't really need to worry about it. The problem is that quite a lot of uh, scope is left to the Home Secretary to decide what she thinks conducive to the public good means. And at the moment, the Home Office's published policy says that it applies to people who've committed acts of terrorism or to people who've committed very serious offences. But the problem is, I think, that we know that this government isn't respectful of human rights. You know, are six million people going to have their citizenship taken away? No, they're not. Um, that's not going to happen. Certainly not going to happen immediately after this is passed. But it could certainly, uh, if the government decides to interpret the legislation in a slightly more broad way than it is at the moment, it could lead to a lot more people being deprived of their citizenship. But I think more fundamentally than that, it sends people a signal that their citizenship is provisional. And obviously that is sending a signal to people overwhelmingly from uh, migrant communities, people who are more likely to have second citizenships than, than people uh, who are not from migrant communities or not from recent migrant communities. That was Alison McKenzie, an asylum and immigration lawyer. Aaron, I want to bring you in on this story because this has shocked and appalled um, a lot of people this week. And I think in many ways, this is an incredibly shocking and appalling law. But this particular aspect of it is is interesting because actually the, the shocking thing is what was already the case, because it was already the case that you could strip someone of their citizenship if they had dual citizenship or if they were born somewhere else mm. and could potentially be eligible for dual citizenship. That was always something which impacted these 6 million people that the New Statesman article was talking about. In terms of that ONS data, these people will be disproportionately affected. But now they can do that without any warning. And I think most people would be shocked that that was the case in the first place, right? What I've also heard is that people who could potentially apply for citizenship elsewhere according to the laws of that country, that's also something in the mix which hasn't been mentioned. So for instance, in Israel, if one of your four grandparents are... Jewish, Israeli, you can apply for citizenship. I know that in Iran, if your father is born in Iran, it's quite easy for a son to get Iranian nationality. So I, I, that, I mean, again, I, just for a clarification, Michael, that that is new. I mean, that's what was being suggested by the New Statesman article. Is that not the case? Or that, I had a longer conversation with that that immigration asylum lawyer, which did really click because I've been quite confused all week. So essentially, what is the case is that at the moment. Um, and, and it will still be the case, is you can be stripped if you're a dual national or if you were born abroad and are entitled to dual nationality. So if you were, you were born in Ireland, but you don't have an Irish passport, but you could apply for one, then they can strip it from you. The Shemima Begum one, which I know we were talking about earlier in the week because we were confused about, mm. is Bangladesh is seems to have a, a citizenship law which is relatively unique. There might be other countries which do it, I'm not sure. But if you are of Bangladeshi, origin, then Bangladesh gives you automatic citizenship. Or at least that was the government's argument, and that was the government's argument that the High Court accepted. So the government's argument was not that Shamima Begum was entitled to Bangladeshi citizenship, but that she was a Bangladeshi citizen, because the Bangladeshi government says if you are of Bangladeshi background, I you appreciate are automatically that, but she a Bangladeshi wasn't, I, citizen. It, it seems to apply specifically to that country. So for example, let's look at Israel. Israel, if you are Jewish, you can apply to be an Israeli citizen, yeah. but you still have to apply. Israel doesn't consider every Jew in the world an Israeli citizen. Whereas with Shamima yeah. Begum, I think, as far as I understand it, and from rereading that New Statesman article and speaking to the to the to the barrister just there, it, it is that in the case specifically of Bangladesh, they treat you as automatically a citizen of Bangladesh. You don't even have to apply for it. Up until you're twenty-one, right? Which you, of course, she was up until you're twenty-one. Yeah, exactly. 
I've never applied for dual nationality, being both you know UK or Iranian national. I've never done that, primarily because of how I'd be treated in Iran. If I went to Iran as a dual national, as Nazanin Zaghari Radcliffe has found out, yes, it's far easier to enter the country because you're using an Iranian passport rather than a visa, a tourist visa. But if you are arrested in Iran as a dual national, they treat you as an Iranian. That's why I never, ever dreamed of applying. However, the idea that I would have applied for Iranian nationality, say, when I was 18, and that that would be grounds to therefore remove my British nationality. When I was born here, you know, it's my native tongue. I've been raised in the education system here, went to university here, I'm married here, etc. It does seem quite remarkable. And like you say, that that shift isn't recent. I think the most recent shift actually was 2014. Prior to that, the thing about removing nationality of dual nationals was 2006. And I suppose, you know, I mean, where do people want to go with this? You know, we saw in the Second World War um, internment of, you know, Japanese Americans in the US. And I do feel, Michael, if there was ever some sort of conflict, like a peer conflict between, you know, the UK, less the UK, because we're going to be sort of on the sidelines here, more so the US. But if there was a peer conflict between, which is to say two parallel powers, not like, you know, Argentina and the UK or the US and, you know, Honduras, but, you know, the US, UK versus China or the UK and Iran, <clears throat> I, I do think we would see this being clearly um, used to remove people's nationality quite, quite quickly. And, you know, they're, they're saying like a war zone. Well, if we if we did go to war with China, you know, what would the position be on, on Chinese nationals in this country? Because like you say, the general effect that it creates is to basically create two sets of citizens in this country. If you've only got a British passport and you've got you know, no possibility of applying for dual nationality, and you're married to a Brit, and all your ancestors are white British, you, you are clearly playing on a very different field when it comes to civil liberties and your citizenship than other people. And, you know, the idea that an Irish person, for instance, could be born there, but then raised here, and they could, they could lose their nationality. I mean, it's monstrous. But it is important to say, because this is, this is the political moment we inhabit, the nasty Tories, Boris Johnson, have to get them out. Labour always better, no matter what you think. Well, actually, Labour introduced um, migrant detention centres. Labour introduced uh, the removal of uh, nationality from dual nationals. Labour were the people when uh, Roma, Roma people from Central and Eastern Europe were entering Britain after 2005 six. They were discriminating against them at the border. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, it's a longer term issue. The removal of, of, of even notice is just remarkable. But I think this feeds into a broader problem which is that I, I, I do think the elites of the US, the UK, they are giving up on aspects of democracy quite quickly, quite quickly. And it is disturbing. That's most obvious with the Republican Party and the, and, and the sort of Trump administration, 2016 to 2020. And it's coming back into sight again with the sort of Republican nominee process, the, the primary for a Republican candidate for the next presidential election. Of course, Trump is almost certainly going to win that. But it's also visible here. And, and I do think in the 2020s, we'll continue to see this move away from democratic norms and, and, and equality under the law. Really, really grim. The direction's pretty obvious. And that's not hyperbolic. It doesn't have to be fascism for people to be giving up on democracy. I think it's important to know, because I was a bit confused about whether or not this applied to anyone who had a parent from another country. And I think that seems to not be the case after speaking to my, my guest earlier and, and rereading about it. But it's important to note that it's still incredibly shocking. The idea that people who are British, who've lived here their whole life, or you know, the vast majority of their life, this is the only place they know, essentially, saying they're less British because they were born, ab born abroad. That's precisely what gave us the Windrush scandal. So we're applying exactly the same logic here that everyone, you know, had to agree was was an outrage and we're doing something along a similar logic again so it doesn't seem like it's going to end well